All right, and now please join me in welcoming Yvonne Rayner and Lynn Tillman. It's a great honor to be talking with Yvonne about her work, just to be talking with Yvonne, in fact. And um, I spent the last week watching everything again, and it was very intense and edifying. And I don't know who of you uh, also saw Alexander Kluge's films in the, I believe it was the mid to late 80s that all of them were shown, all of them up till that time were shown at Anthology Film Archive. And because it was right in my neighborhood, I went every day and I saw every film. And I was thinking about his films and your films, Yvonne, because it gave me a sense of what was going on in Germany uh, in the 60s and into the 70s in a way that reading a newspaper, any news reports, or uh, historical accounts, any journalism. It, it told me something about Germany that I hadn't understood before, hadn't known before, and it had to do with the sensibilities of people living then. And I felt that way, Yvonne, about watching your films uh, from lives of performance through to uh, Murder and Murder, which was your last feature film. And there is a kind of, at least watching it this time, there was a kind of through line, I thought, in terms of what carried on in, I thought, all of the films, which had to do with the passions, the passion around uh, sex, romance, emotion, and the passion for a certain kind of politics or um, social intellectual, change. social change, and uh, the sort of rationality versus irrationality, consciousness versus unconsciousness, or lack of consciousness, not necessarily the unconscious. And by watching them all together, I think I've probably confused some of them, but we're going to start. Me, me too. <laughs> we're going to start with um, with lives of performers, and we're going to show a clip from that first. I was curious how you directed Valda mm -hmm. Satterfield. Well, this film is very different uh, from all the ones that followed in that there's no sync sound whatsoever. So I wrote a script uh, with potentials for dialogue, uh, but I assigned various parts of the script uh, to the various performers uh, with instructions to either paraphrase or read uh, parts of the uh, texts. Uh, and here, Valda had instructions to, uh, she, I told her, uh, it's a very big close-up, so any move you make will take you out of the frame. Uh, so uh, what uh, you will instigate the movement in the frame, like even changing, shifting your weight a little bit will take you to the edge of the frame, and when you see the camera follow you to uh, center you again, then move again. So she is telling this story, uh, but it was recorded uh, uh, at a, a previous uh, time. Uh, it's the same story that she is actually speaking, but totally out of sync. Yeah. Um, I know there was a reason I wanted to show a short clip from the Hands movie. Mm -hmm. Because watching her, I was watching her mouth, mm -hmm. and it, be, it was moving in a way like the fingers on the hand. I became very... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this is your first fe sorry, feature film, or long film, and it comes after you've stopped, you know, you've decided not to dance anymore, not to choreograph anymore. 
and then you make this film. And I, I, I wonder about what you expected from film as compared with making dances. Um, I expected film to deal with more uh, uh, specific social and political issues. That's why I went into uh, feature films. Um, dan the kind of dance I made, wa I felt, was very limited. I mean, it was abstract, athletic. Um, sometimes I, uh, we spoke, uh, uh, memorized set pieces, but uh, uh, I didn't feel that the kind of dance I made could encompass uh, things outside of dancing. My dancing dealt with a, a dance history, really, and I uh, came to the end of what I could do within those limits. And, uh, and I had always followed experimental film. I saw, even before I came to New York, I saw films by uh, Brackage and Maya Deren and, uh, and the uh, French art films, Renoir and, uh, yeah, Vigo. And You've always had a, 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 I don't know if it's a vexed attitude toward narrative, mm -hmm. and yeah. and that's interesting. It's not cinematic, cinematic yeah. narrative, but yeah. you also wanted to, and I think this was through your involvement as a feminist, mm -hmm. tell certain stories mm -hmm. uh, that were particular, in some ways not only, but to uh, women. Mm -hmm. um, well, it was the women's movement in the late 60s, early 70s that gave me permission to uh, um, make uh, so-called stories around my own experiences. So, yeah, uh, these early films, although they weren't explicitly political, they were certainly influenced by the women's resurgence of the of feminism yeah i think they were explicitly political mm, i think okay. these are yeah <laughs> i mean i think <laughs> i think it you know it, we could define politics more broadly. broadly yes and i think we should i mean anyway i do and i want you to also <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take your word for it i mean i was called anti-feminist because i i didn't feel I was politically active and I didn't feel entitled to call myself a feminist. So some people thought I was anti-feminist up till the mid 70s. Well, you, have, yeah. you have too many compunctions. You've always had too many compunctions. What do you mean? Well, I mean that you, um, you know, for instance, not saying that your that work was political. Oh, you, yeah. Because you have oh, some, yeah. I think you, or to say that this, these, these films were not informed by feminism, as if there's but a... But they were. Of course they yeah, were. Yeah, they were. Uh, and I, I, I don't th deny that. No. <laughs> I don't want, want you to... De don't deny that. And the way in which um, movement and dance permeates uh, yeah. the, um, the lives of performers, mm -hmm. that, that's also very interesting to me. Um, and I wondered how some of the people you worked with were dancers like mm. Valda, but some were not, mm. like Shirley Yeah, Salva. well, I took my profession with me into filmmaking. Uh, yeah, Valda was dancing with Merce Cunningham at the time, um, and uh, several of the people had dance training. Uh, John Erdman did not. Um, but, and Shirley Sofer did not uh, in, in this film, yeah. And, but if, I mean, it's interesting that you use non-dancers because one of the things that your work was uh, famous for was walking, let's say. Uh, mm. And uh, the idea a that- Big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Why was that a big mistake? Uh, there was a lot of other stuff in those dances than, oh, sorry. than uh, <laughs> pedestrian movement. I mean, that, that's a misconception about Judson Church also, that it was all about uh, daily uh, pedestrian activities. But there was all kinds of movement at Judson, including in my work. Yeah. 
Well, I didn't mean to say it was only, but you know, yeah. the, the, the idea that people could walk, but then you did yeah. Tree OA, yeah. which you, you, I mean, it was very Even ironic. to this day, in one of the reviews uh, around this uh, series, uh, mentions Tree OA as being all about walking. <laughs> Come on. I mean, more like John Cleese's silly walks, right? I mean, right. no one could walk like right. Trio A. Right. That would be impossible. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's go to a um, film about a woman who. Those are um, letters from George Jackson's wife to him when he was in prison. Angela Davis from Angela Davis to George Jackson. Oh, I thought, oh, she called herself his wife. Yeah, right. yeah. That's right. But uh, I, if I were to reshoot this, I would make it clear that there, uh, there are excerpts from uh, the published, uh, um, her, from her diary that were exposed in the daily press. I, I mean, it looks like it's, my typing, but they're actually cut out from uh, uh, when he was on trial. George Jackson was a black uh, revolutionary activist, and uh, um, and she wrote to him while he was in prison. And these are excerpts from her letters, and her um, and they were used to implicate her in in uh, this situation. Um, but I, I think my concern putting them on my face was um, uh, the idea of exposure and exploitation. Um, and it had come after uh, the, what immediately precedes this, uh, the long tracking shot into uh, the um, uh, two people uh, helping uh, one of my performers to undress and lie out nude on a couch. Uh, so this idea of exposure of what is not ordinarily uh, exposed uh, was then um, repeated in this exposure of Angela Davis's intimate letters to George Jackson. One of the reasons I wanted uh, to show this clip is that um, the, again, the questions around passion, mm -hmm. political passion, mm -hmm. sexual passion, mm -hmm. and love, uh, I thought putting them on the stoical face, on your stoical face, but a viewer no doesn't necessarily know it's you, was extremely, um, uh, it was it was a kind of contradiction, because here this stoical face talking about or with these with these um, excerpts from very passionate letters on the face. I mean, I'm very struck with the stoicism in these early films. They're very much about emotion and betrayal, but not. Um, enacted. Not enacted, yeah. never in, enacted. Now is that, apart from whatever your feelings were about acting at that time, and I think over time they change in your film, did that have to do with your attitudes also about how dancers should perform? Um. Yeah, I mean it was part. Yeah, it's part of my dance training. Uh, you, you did the movement. You didn't uh, uh, express. Uh, it was a whole attitude about expressionism or uh, expressivity, and uh, like Cunningham, I studied with Cunningham for eight years, and uh, uh, his dancers were known for not. Uh, for having pretty neutral facial expressions, and uh, it was the movement that uh, uh, the body itself, uh, in and of itself, was expressive and uh, didn't need anything added in uh, dramatization, say, yeah. And that the tracking, you like tracking shots a lot, but in, in your, they, you use them a lot. Well, it's funny, that particular 
tracking shot that preceded this tracking into my face, uh, I thought was uh, uh, influenced by um, Michael um, Snow's wavelength. Snow's wavelength. That was a a zoom, and I I mistakenly thought it was a a tracking shot. So, you know, so it goes. <laughs> yeah. But also the uh, is it. Um, now I'm forgetting the, the name of the actor, but the woman lying. Renfrew. Renfrew. She's being undressed by yeah. him, and finally she's entirely nude on, on the couch lying there. Is yeah. that when the man, so there, there's a man and a woman yeah. standing behind the couch looking down mm -hmm. on her. Is that when the man puts his hand on her breast? Uh, well, first his, the hand, you see, goes down the, oh, we should have showed a little bit of that. And then the last shot in that sequence bef uh, before, I, I forget now, but he does move his hand and it ends on her pubic area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, but it, it's so uh, formalized. I mean, it's very asexual, it's weird. I don't uh, know if yeah. it's asexual, uh, no, I, I, I didn't. Think so. It's. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was quite the on your point <laughs> opposite, but you were not. Again, it was not a allowing for certain response. I mean, both the faces of the yeah. actor and the two actors behind the couch. Yeah, they don't betray anything. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. And yet, the film is all about betrayal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Couldn't couldn't resist that. Yeah. Couldn't resist that. Yeah. Now we we should go to the Maya Darren. We have a lot to cover, so we're yeah. moving this yeah. right along. Move on um, to uh, a big influence. This particular uh, sequence from Maya Darren's At Land. This so this had an impact on Christina talking pictures. You the cutting, but. It, uh, I think I chose the the place in Christina. It was in 1976. No, yeah. Shall we show that? Yeah, let's yeah. show that, and then we can talk a little bit about it. <laughs> what that has to do with Maya Darren? <laughs> <laughs> well, there were moments I, I thought um, this Christina uh, talking pictures. Uh, seemed to me to be a, 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 a great transitional film for you. Uh, it, there's, it's very much about uh, artificiality versus the natural world or something about being natural compared with artificial. And Christina is a circus performer and there are lots of shots in the film of, uh, who is that lion tamer? Um, um, her name was Christina something. No, 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 oh. but the, the, oh, uh, the, oh, the, the, the uh, actual lion tamer. The guy. The uh, guy. Famous know, lion tamer. He oh. looked sort of like Liberace, uh, but, he was a, but he worked with No, many. he's much more handsome. No, he's yeah. Huh? Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, and there are lots Gobber of shots time. in that, and there's a lot about, I think, at cruelty to animals. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there are so many things that this film is mm. about, but it, it's, it's all it, over the place. It I is. Mean, it yeah. is. And it. it um, <laughs> there's also a kind of your response to Godard. Mm -hmm. There's, I think, a lot about um, how one does a narrative and whether uh, acting is something you want to be involved with or not. And that, that's when Yvonne is playing, is playing Christina. Christina. Yeah. And well, uh, Christina is played by about four different uh, performers. Yeah. yeah. Primarily mm -hmm. one, though. Yeah. Primarily one. When the return of Raoul uh, gets into uh, the the pollution, oil pollution by these big uh, uh, um, carriers, and uh, uh, Raoul, uh, it was a book uh, very well known at the time, uh, 
I forget what it was called, but it, ex it the journalist, the writer, uh, was a passenger on one of these big ships and uh, talked about the dangers of the capsizing of these uh, uh, ships. And uh, so I incorporated what this information into long monologues by my brother who plays this character, Raul, who has returned to, uh, who is having an affair with Christina, one of the Christinas who's played by me. Yeah. Which was a very, uh, if you knew that that was your brother watching it, it was very interesting. And <laughs> well, the, the, I had certain friends who were shocked. I mean, all we do is talk. I mean, we're, it's very... Uh, but I realized why you used him for, and I'm sure there were many other... He had a good memory. He could well, he remember. did, he yeah. did. He, he, but he looks more like Belmondo than, than... And so again, it was a reference to Godard, I thought, using somebody who... Because in profile especially, yeah. he, he's, a, he's a kind of ringer for Belmondo. Yeah. So was that your original reason for wanting to work no, with him? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's a handsome dude, of course, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I knew he could... Uh, had this memory, the, uh, the long passages he had to learn. I yeah. know, yeah. I know, and he wasn't reading them at all. He had no. just memorized them. So I wanted to ask you about your different feelings toward acting versus dancing, because years ago you and I had a conversation, and when I said to you something about dance was abstract, mm -hmm. you said, but it's always about the body. It's not abstract. Mm -hmm. And so you always felt, I don't mean to put words into your mouth, but that dancing was always somehow real, but acting wasn't? Yes, the body <coughs> is material that exists in the present. And acting, uh, in film anyway, uh, is already an illusion, it's past. I mean, what you see has happened in the past, and uh, the, it's about uh, impersonation. And uh, Even though the they're using their bodies and faces. Yeah, and speaking uh, lines that don't belong to them, yeah. You know, that, that reminds me of Mansfield Park, uh, Jane Austen's novel, because in the middle of it, they put on a play uh, and it be, it's very shocking to some of the people because people are performing lines that they would not have said in so-called real life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a very, it's a, a kind of turning point in, in that novel. Exactly, that's the way I felt and why I, I uh, hired non-actors at the beginning, you know, who... Uh, uh, could read, uh, and I always made it clear. In fact, in lives, the, someone asked the question, Yvonne, were you reading that or saying that? And I say, <laughs> I, was re I was remembering it from Hofstra, which referred to a previous performance. So I was always making these distinctions between uh, the illusionism. Uh, and when I got into film, you know, I was very aware of the the devices, the strategies of Hollywood movies to draw, like Pauline Kael famously said, uh, movies uh, are the only place where you can send your mind away. And I wanted <laughs> to have my cake and eat it to uh, enable that, in, especially in the later films, but undermine it also. Right. You know, I wanted you to maintain a critical distance, but also use that, those other strategies. Now, watching, watching one after the other of your f films, it was more like reading a, a, a week <laughs> immersed in this work. My God, what stamina. <laughs> but but um, uh, it was more like reading a novel than watching a Hollywood movie. Uh, it, because there were so many different uh, 
planes of interest and so many different things that you were doing in these films. And uh, one had to uh, really stay with what was go going on uh, and to be very conscious. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things, um, I'm not against illusion or manipulation. Well, neither am I. No, no really. I, I, I know, I know you <laughs> you're not really. Um, but one of the things that your work um, does is both kind of force you as you're watching it to uh, be thinking mm. along with the characters. And when the characters change their minds or begin to do think differently, it's, um, it gets very uh, complex and I think this leads us nicely into Journeys from Berlin. What a great segue. <laughs> <laughs> so Journeys from Berlin, this is um, uh, 1980. In, in Journeys from Berlin, I think that uh, question of yours between, and that, that, that opposition between the personal and the political is most pronounced. Uh, the, your interest in uh, anarchists of the 19th and 20th century um, is very much at the heart of the film, along with psychoanalysis. Uh, Annette Michelson plays um, the Analysand, and she's, uh, she's a film theorist. And uh, she also did, memorized tons, tons of, <laughs> it was it, it actually incredible that, sh, uh, that she memorized all of this. And she's looking at the camera, and the analyst, whoever it is, uh, has his or her back to the camera. So we never see the face of the analyst uh, who is played by three different performers uh, a man a woman and a nine-year-old boy right <laughs> right and uh, Nett Michelson gives an extraordinary <laughs> performance uh, and she is talking as if to her analyst and saying all kinds of things both personal and political of course obviously about her psyche or what she's thinking. And at one point she says, and this happens to be to the child who's playing the analyst, she said, says, I plead guilty to an absence of humanity. And it's at the core of this film. Uh, what, what is, what it is, is it to be a human being? How does one, um, what should one do? Should one be Ulrika Meinhof? Mm -hmm. Or should one be, you know, uh, engaged in some ways but never take those kinds of actions? What constitutes humanity? Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, it's a cliche. I mean, I never, when I read it, and you, you read it almost daily in some form in the papers, uh, uh, it has lost meaning, especially today, you know? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess uh, one way to characterize this film is uh, ambivalence, you know. Um, uh, the, the guilt and the, uh, the analysand and uh, uh, my own um, uh, uh, reservations and ambivalence about being ineffective in the world at large and uh, um, so it takes all kinds of forms and uh, the, I was in this dialogue between the two people who you never see in this film it's all voiceover while they're cooking dinner all those sound effects are chopping of carrots and uh, messing around in the kitchen uh, while the camera is doing something totally different. Um, uh, I had a, a, a fellowship, uh, the, Bar the uh, Deutsche Akademische, it was a German fellowship uh, during 
the Cold War uh, in Western Berlin when there was still a war, 19, mid 70s. And uh, uh, Bader and, Mein uh, and his associates in Meinhof had already been arrested and were in prison. Uh, but some of their cohorts were still active and there were uh, uh, explosions and uh, violence uh, going on around the country. And um, so I didn't feel that I, I was, uh, I, I did a little bit of shooting a while there, but uh, um, the, all those two people walking around in front of the church, um, I, I managed to uh, stage and film while there, but I didn't know how I was going to use it. Uh, uh, but even then, they represented possible uh, enact of political violence. The word terrorism I never used in the film. Um, it was, uh, and, and the guilt of uh, both Botter and Meinhof was still being, uh, uh, and their, their supposed suicides with being uh, af in the late seven, no, in, in the late 1976 after I had returned to New York, uh, was still de being debated in in radical cir uh, circles. Maybe they had been assassinated in in prison, uh, and I didn't take a stand in in the film on this one way or the other. But political violence is a basic theme uh, throughout the film, with long, crawling titles about. Uh, the uh, repressive measures by the German government at that time. It seemed to me watching this film and then um, the next one that we're going to look at a small clip, uh, The Man Who uh, Envied Women, mm -hmm. uh, that you use psychoanalysis as a kind of uh, mediating force. Mm -hmm. That it stands between um, political action and personal responsibility, that the characters uh, are not only discussing their so-called personal lives, their, but also their relationship to their political lives. And it has very little to do with psychoanalytic theory, right? Well, why, would, why do you, yes, it does. I mean, things, well, Freud said that, Just how do you mean? Well. I set up the the structure. I, I mean, the the analysis does not lie down for one thing, mm -hmm. uh, and she and the analyst. I mean, I set up the the social relationship, but uh, I certainly wasn't trying to. Uh, the the monologue by Annette Michelson is so surreal. Uh, uh, it's almost impersonal uh, for the most part. So uh, Freudian theory is certainly not part of this film. Well, it, maybe it's not explicit in terms of how, uh, in terms of what is said. It, the, the theory isn't brought up, but it seemed to me to be very active in that it was about uh, talking. Right, but there's all kinds of talking. But she's yeah. talking to whether it's a an actual session or not. The idea is that one, um, you know, it. In, yeah, in stream of consciousness. I mean, there, that there is stream there of is consciousness, that. and you know, Freud was also um, socially. Uh, the day, let's say, the, day, the detritus of the day would appear in the dream. So one's social mm -hmm. conditions uh, were, uh, and what one experienced were also part of your unconscious. Mm. Okay. And, and so in that way, I thought it was using psychoanalysis as a mm. kind of bridge between mm. the, the, lived, the lived life, the pol so-called political life, and the life, uh, the, the psychic life, and how these things were embedded. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now let's look at, <laughs> I don't know if I've convinced her, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Um, so now we're going to, to be continued. To be continued, yes. Our discussions have been going on a long time. Um, we're going to look at the 19, a clip from the 1985 film, The Man Who Envied Women. That's the very beginning of this film. Uh, there was a, there's a term used now. Actually, I, I can't stand the term, but mansplaining. Man what? Splaining. Oh. Mansplaining. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't used at the time that you made this film, but there's a hell of a lot of mansplaining in this film. That uh, character, his name is Jack Deller. I was very aware of the kind of uh, pun, Jack, tell her. <laughs> and uh, uh, he's played by two different performers. Uh, um, I forget the guy's name. This it's one, Mabu, Mabu, Mabu Bill Minds, Bill Raymond. Bill Raymond. Bill Raymond. Yes, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I forget the the name of the other man. Um, Larry. Larry. Larry yes. Thank you, <laughs> Larry Lunin. Yeah. And we were trying to remember there was a Boonwell film, uh, in which he switches the, the women, uh, yes. and it's never meant. It, it, that wasn't. What's the name of that? What was it? Oh, this, that obscure object of desire. Of desire. That's yeah. right. right. And that was after the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie. Yeah. We could, could, yeah. Um, and some people didn't notice when the the two <laughs> women changed in uh, the um, in in the boom obscure. World? Yeah. Uh -huh. But it was very, I thought, very noticeable it's in your... very clear here, your the two men, yeah. There's a lot of lecturing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a scene... Um, um, uh, who's the, the, the... Bill Raymond. No, not the actor. The writer that the, I based the lecture on, uh, uh, Zimmer. Uh -huh. uh, Tom, Zimmer, Tom, Tom Zimmer, who was a, 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 uh, uh, a an assistant or an acolyte of Foucault, and uh, um, he, I recorded a conversation we had, uh, and um, Bill Raymond delivers this lecture that's uh, verbatim from this uh, uh, what Zimmer, uh, it's a Foucauldian kind of uh, uh, lecture to a, a room full of bored students um, in a newly uh, renovated loft in, um, uh, on Broadway, Lower Broadway. And the camera tracks uh, finally through this loft into this new empty kitchen and bathroom, and uh, uh, I always felt if I were to shoot that again, I would put a huge banner on the wall, which I actually saw when I was in Seattle. It said, move up to downtown, because um, the, at the end of this film, uh, this is the one with the, all about the Lower East Side, the city selling off property and uh, artists moving in and taking up these spaces. So uh, I, I was very conscious of this loft being one of these uh, spaces uh, that w were renovated and were symptomatic of uh, small manufacturers moving out of Manhattan because the rents kept going up. As, as in all your films, there are several different themes, mm -hmm. and, and one of them is, and uh, I don't know who filmed that meeting, but there was a meeting of um, like a city town hall council. about, uh, <laughs> what? It was the city council. City council, city council. discussing, there was a discussion about artists, uh, housing. housing, artist housing, yeah. and whether artists should get, be allowed to have these city apartments. Yes. And there were then residents from the community, lower income people. And there was a great 
argument um, mm -hmm. that was that was filmed. Uh, Unfortunately, I I'm even in that scene. I uh, I was on the wrong side of this argument and. Uh, uh, we were all shot down. Uh, ironically, those spaces were eventually taken over by artists. Yeah. This particular group in the late 70s, uh, uh, the Lower East Side uh, residents went to bat and, uh, and the city council sh shot down the whole project. The artists' housing. But then later on, yeah came around again. Uh, so th then again, the conflict between uh, sort of theory and praxis uh, with, with the men also, because they, they talk in a certain way, and sometimes their actions are in another way. And is, is this the film in which people are on the telephone, or is that privilege? Well, there is a lot of public use of the public telephone, which of course. Oh, which film That's is murder, that? Murder, murder. That's murder and murder. Mm -hmm. That was not at all in privilege. Yes. Well, one of the interesting things about looking at these films, it's like watching Chantal Ackerman's News from Home, which was shot uh, before Tribeca was Tribeca, and you see uh, the city in in a way that it no longer is. But you also see. Uh, Telephone booths being being used in your right. films right. a lot, actually. Yeah. I had this experience today. I walked down the street past the loft building, three-story loft building I lived in. It was my, in nineteen late fifties, and there had been a huge parking lot next to it. And two years ago, I think I walked by this same place and the parking lot was still there. Today, I walked past it and there was a skyscraper yes. that occupied that parking lot. I, it was sh shocking. How it fast, yeah. how fast. Yeah. Um, the next film uh, we're going to talk about briefly is Privilege, 1990. This may be one of your most complicated films. It's, it starts out as a film uh, that seems to be a documentary about menopause, in, in, uh, in which uh, a woman uh, whose name is Yvonne Washington, uh, who is an African-American woman, is questioning her white friend, Jenny, about menopause. And somehow, from menopause, you um, move into questions of race, class, sexual orientation, sex in general. And uh, I don't know how you do it. it did, I mean, I know I watched it. I've watched it a couple of times. And so I watched how you did it. Today, we talk about uh, intersectionality. It's a, another term I can't stand. Um, it's it's just an ugly word, but no, but that but that term again, um, just like mansplaining, was not being used at the time that Yvonne made privilege, and it takes in so many different questions through the vector. First and foremost of. Yvonne Washington talking to Jenny. And there are flashbacks, there are, uh, there are all sorts of ways in which Jenny's past is brought into the, to the present. Uh, how did you put that film together? How did you? Well, a lot of it is biographic, autobiographical. So I had these complicated experiences. That last paragraph encapsulates so many different social issues. And uh, um, it was my experience in my late 40s, I guess. I was at a conference in El Paso. And uh, 
I met this Mexican-American student, and uh, I had a flirtation with a guy who was at the same, uh, he was younger than I, and uh, uh, was uh, shocked to hear what he, how he spoke about a younger woman, and in the evening, went out, El Paso is on a, a hill, uh, or this university rather, and uh, you look over the Rio Grande and everything is dark. I mean, it's a, a shanty town uh, in Mexico you're looking at, and, uh, and on this side there are bright lights lighting the streets, and, uh, and it, it was a, uh, for me it was a, uh, you know, a concrete experience of social uh, inequality on, uh, on this border. And, uh, and that, having just had this other experience dealing with the um, patriarchy and sexual attitudes uh, on the part of uh, uh, the male, uh, this guy. And so it just came together. That was one thing here. Uh, but then the flashback in the, um, uh, Jenny's flashback in the film was my experience. I moved into a tenement on East 25th Street. Uh, it was an all white building on a Puerto Rican block. And uh, over across the air shaft was a Puerto Rican couple who fought uh, all the time. And uh, uh, downstairs below me was a lesbian neighbor. And she left her shades up. And the guy uh, came, uh, got drunk and came across the air shaft and tried to rape her. And uh, I called the police. So <laughs> I mean, there were so many... Uh, 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 experiences that uh, uh, but experience, but experience is one thing, and art is an, another thing. And the way in which you well, not in that not in my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, film, but, but the but the film is art. I mean, you yeah. don't just put experience. It is. It, it you cannot. I'm not saying that we don't use things that happen to us, but it's another thing in the way that you shot that. So for instance, yeah. when Brenda, the, the white lesbian, is attacked by Carlos, they do a kind of dance. Oh, of course, yeah, then get them together to have a dialogue. That's, and, that's yeah, right, but, yeah, that's, yeah. but that wasn't your experience. No. <laughs> That's, right. that's, that's the claim that yeah. I'm making is for, uh, uh, is for right. art. You're yes. quite right, <laughs> yeah. How, how do you get the arguments in? And, uh, uh, how, so, and, and uh, counter the illusionism of, of, uh, of uh, uh, the replication of life that we're asked to uh, believe in. That's why we go to the movies to for this uh, to follow these dreams. And I think somewhere I wrote uh, someone quoted from something I wrote. Uh, how do you wake this audience that dreams with all its eyes open? You know. <laughs> well, so also by having that sequence, you allow Carlos. A to voice. A, a voice, yeah. which is extremely yeah. yes. important. Um, I nearly gave up this film. I felt I was uh, talking, he was a white privileged person talking about the other. Uh, I had no rights to do it. I felt I was on uh, uh, thin ice and... Uh, but you did it. Uh, I nearly gave it up and uh, then I persisted and... Uh, 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 there's a great uh, piece in the one of the current New Yorkers, uh, Richard uh, Brody. Brody, yeah. Uh, he makes a point. It was not really appreciated when it came out. Uh, he may be too young to know. I don't know whether, but it's a very acute uh, uh, description of this particular p uh, film. You, you might and run up against. Uh, same kinds of issues 
now. Um, and this is a way much longer kind of discussion around the effects of identity politics and who can make what art and, yeah. who's, and in, who's entitled to speak for whom. Or, yeah. But Craig Owen said something very important. He said it's not speaking for, it's speaking to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and I, I didn't feel, and I still don't feel, that that was a film speaking for in the sense of taking over, but raising a lot of and I, I use quotes. I didn't write all of this. No. I, I used Foucault. I used all kinds of people. The right. quotes, yeah. I didn't trust my own uh, language and insights. Well, yeah. it's, it's an important film because I think we're at a period, again, where a lot of people are very, very afraid mm -hmm. to write and to make art or to... Um, uh, and uh, I think... Um, it's incumbent, especially upon white people, yeah. to figure out what their prejudices are, and the only way to do that is actually to expose them. Uh, you're not going to make any kind of movement, uh, I mean, in the psychic life of white people in this country unless there's some exposure of that. In other words, being wrong can be right in, in its own way. All right, uh, having said that, let's go to your last mm -hmm. <laughs> film. So um, we're going to see a, a clip from Murder, in all caps, and Murder, lowercase. But I, I want to uh, refer to s something you said, that this, in this film, the emotional conflicts reach a resolution. Yes. And we're going to show that scene. Scene now, yes, yeah. yes. So um, just quickly, uh, this film's about cancer, but it's also, it's a romance, a great romance. And in the, uh, there is a, an emotional resolution in this film. And watching all the films together, I felt that you had, you had reached a kind of that resolution in, in, in the work, that the two women are very different from each other, and yet, and, uh, and yet they, they finally can move in together, which is as if, you know, metaphorically speaking, you're moving these, the conflict between love and politics and I ideas and uh, emotions together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, so now, uh, <laughs> on that cheery note, Yvonne will take some questions from the, from the audience. Um, to uh, bring it back to Maya Darren quickly, um, uh, one of the uh, amazing parts of uh, Atlanta, which we showed actually with Christina Talking Pictures, um, is the way that uh, every cut holds the promise of some new kind of enigmatic discontinuity, like that it'll, you know, Darren will be walking and then it'll cut to someone she's speaking with and it'll cut back to Darren and then when it cuts back it's like the you know the the person is has changed and will change again and this is uh for me very reminiscent of like so many of your films and you've mentioned this that in the man who made women the um title character is played by two different men you know there are three different analysts and yeah the non sequitur is like uh, yeah. uh, the phone ringing in the Boxing ring. Oh yeah, no, but also, but but also, just but, but specifically a discontinuity in casting. That this is something that you know um, is like coming up again and again. And I was just curious, like what uh, what appeals to you about this strategy of having Christina and Christina talking pictures played by you and another uh, actor and so forth. Oh, I was just saying, like what what appeals to you about this uh, strat this kind of maneuver of having uh, multiple. Uh, oh, actors playing playing the same, the same uh, yeah. uh -huh. a la well it just breaks it up you know uh, again it's uh, like uh, 
the, uh, I'm very interested in unpredictability. So all of a sudden you're seeing someone else uh, playing the same character. So it's, a, again, it's a matter of having my cake and eat it. I can draw you in with one character, especially in the later films where there were professional actors, and then switch. And uh, so you don't, you have to stay on your toes a little bit to uh, follow these films. And uh, that's one of the themes, I think, yeah. I don't know how to say this as a question, but one thing I notice is that there's reading a lot, and usually we go to a movie and we just think we're seeing images, but we go to your movies and we're reading a lot. And then I guess that just made me think of your love of reading. And I, I, is there anything you have to say about sort of putting those, juxtaposing the act of reading with the act of seeing images? It's so, it's so different from what we expect of a movie. Or as a spectator, the act of hearing suddenly becomes the act of reading. In fact, in Lives of Performers, someone, th there's a voiceover, you're hearing, and mid-sentence, you're suddenly reading the same speech. Right, yeah. I, uh, uh, that was a strategy. Yeah. So it just, it's, it, it makes the viewer have a different mode. You have to switch modes from reading words to seeing images. But I think in some ways the images you're also reading, like the mantle place in Journeys from Berlin, you're sort of reading, as the pan happens, you're reading, it's, that to me is like a combination of both the readings and the images. Because it's like reading left to right. Oh, the hand the is pan, there. The pans across the, the mantelpiece. Yeah, piece. the pans oh, that are yeah. different every yeah, time. Yeah, you're, re you're reading uh, the, the images, yeah, yeah. Uh, in a, in a, like a sentence, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that to me is sort of a, a bridge between reading words and uh -huh. seeing images. Hi. Um, thank you so much for, um, for tonight um, and for all the films. Um, I was thinking sort of to follow on um, what the last questioner just was talking about, the reading, that there's um, this, uh, along with the discontinuity of the casting and with the kind of non sequiturs, there's this other um, sort of um, way that we're taken by surprise, which is through this intense kind of layering that happens. You'll see the computer screen and you're reading that, but you're also listening to an aria being sung at the same time. Or in the boxing ring, there's a text on the mat. So there's always this layering between, the, uh, between sound and reading and the action and the way that the action is being undone or questioned. So sort of digging into the structure. And it, it made me wonder about the difference between, sorry, this is kind of a long question, but um, between your early dance work and what happened when you returned to choreography after this foray of many years as a filmmaker. And if you could talk a little bit about um, how the years of working with film, with this intense kind of uh, layering and using so many media together, if that affected the way that you returned to dance and, and the kind of... Um, the density of the later dances, if that makes any sense. Well, I was never very happy making films. I mean, I loved writing the scripts, I loved editing. Uh, it was pure torture in production uh, because of, of the crew, the, the social hierarchies in making. I mean, there has to be in order to save money and time, and uh, I never had enough money, I never could reshoot, uh, I never got a good sound mix, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, the creating of it beforehand and, and working it out uh, after the production was what interested me and where the satisfactions came because I was in control. <laughs> and in dancing as a, a choreographer, I am both in control and dealing with the work in front of my eyes. I mean, uh, the, 
the, la the once the laboratory got hold of that stuff and it came back, I mean, it was, uh, I, yeah, so many areas of filmmaking, uh, this kind, I never uh, did my own shooting, for instance, so I can't call myself a filmmaker in that sense. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, the experiential part of these two, uh, activities were are very different and uh, coming, I always like to say, coming back to dance, it was like coming home. Um, uh, you have a conversation with these people you're working with, you're not only telling them what to do, you know, it's a... Um, and I and also actors, I've talked to Kathleen Chalfant who plays Mildred in the and uh, I've, I've seen a lot of her work on the stage and uh, some of it is just amazing. And I've tried to get out of her how she does it uh, because I never knew how to direct actors. I mean, sh uh, she especially, she identified immediately with the character. I, I always, almost didn't have to tell her anything. Whereas Joanna, uh, the uh, Doris, uh, she needed a lot of uh, instruction, and I didn't always know what to tell her. But uh, so I, I had this conversation in about five years ago with Kathleen. Uh, how, how, how do you get those emotions? I mean, without uh, destroying yourself. And she didn't know. She couldn't articulate. I mean, actors are amazing people, uh, and. Uh, um, I, I never, and I still don't understand. I mean, I really admire them, all, although in all of my work, I try to undermine what they do. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, uh, I have to say, I'm just filled with awe and respect when I see a, a great performance, yeah. Um, this might be a strange question, perhaps, but I was struck by, um, the presence of dreams, I guess, in your films and in the lives of performers. Uh, there's a dream sequence with the girl and the ball in slow motion and the cat, which I think is the only slow motion shot of the film, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then in Christina, there's also like a dream narration scene. And there's another, um, I think in Berlin, there's like a slow down shot of uh, Meinhof's dream, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and there's always like, or, or at least I've noticed uh, this affinity between dream narrations and the slow motion continuous shots. And I was wondering if there's anything you can say about that. Dreams in slow motion. Uh, I don't know, there's one more, two more options. Uh, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, yeah, in lives there's a dream. Surely, uh, well, the kid is bouncing the ball, uh, and the, it's an actual workshop I gave where people I asked people to bring in their dreams, and I I got permission from Shirley to use her dream about climbing a wall, and the, it, it was useful in that particular with the child. I don't know. Uh, then slow motion. I don't use that very often, uh, or didn't. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of where else it, it was used. Slow motion in... Uh, uh, in Berlin. Uh, in what? In Journeys in Berlin. In Berlin. Uh, where in Journeys? I think it's a narration of uh, Meinhof's dream before... Mm. Or I don't know whose dream it was. I don't. I can't. I can't recall it right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you think of uh, any other? Oh, you know? I, I have no talents in any other. <laughs> <laughs> I can't draw. I, uh, 